Hi, everybody. Um, what an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us up and um, coming out to watch this film tonight. Um, this is a film that um, is many years in the making and um, is the product of incredible sacrifice and risk taken by the subjects in the film. Um, you know, I, I've worked for years in the police space as a visual journalist and a filmmaker, and um, I had, until I met these guys, I had never met anybody like this. And um, the important thing to remember, I think, about this film is that these, what you are going to see is um, ongoing. This is not just uh, a film that, you know, with a sort of a de decisive endpoint. This is, um, these are issues and a situation that. Uh, everybody in the film continues to live through and suffer with and, and try and fight back against. So um, I, I, I've been really um, excited and just um, just amazed at this community that you guys have here. Um, I've been already having a, a, a great conversation with Tommy from um, Justice for Dameek and his colleagues. Um, and and I, I love spaces like this because I feel like the most important of movements always happen between passionate people in hidden, unseen corners of a cities and, and are across the country. And so this feels like one of those places that uh, a lot must grow out of. So um, thank you so much for having us. Oh, and please stick around, because um, there'll be a very special guest um, joining us in the Q&A from the film that um, I think you'll be delighted to um, get to engage with. Thanks. Thanks everybody, Steve. We're actually expecting um, private investor, investigator Manny Gomez, but I don't know where he is. Okay. Well, did you want to introduce yourself? Oh yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Tommy Weddington. Uh, I guess I'm a scholar activist. Uh, been living in Troy for just over a year now. Been organizing with uh, uh, a group uh, trying to uh, Organize and get help and justice for a young man, uh, uh, Dameek. Uh, you, a lot of people here, I'm sure, uh, justice for Dameek. Um, we've been organizing since he was uh, shot by uh, Troy police in August of uh, 2017. Um, and so uh, I was up here, you know, just kind of to, I guess, bring a local uh, flavor to what's happening here, but also, you know, provide some extrapolations. I think from that. Uh, so I'm going to let this man introduce himself now, actually. Oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, part of my tardiness, <laughs> um, Private Investigator Manuel Gomez, and I'm honored to be part of uh, Steve Mang's uh, film. Uh, yeah, so um, I was just telling um, I'm a, I was just telling I'm a uh, local organizer uh, trying to get uh, justice for him. He was shot by police in Troy uh, last year, so we're just uh, finishing up the introduction. So actually, perfect time. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to say it's a real honor to be here. Thank you for coming out on such a cold night to be with us. Um, also, I uh, just want to let you know what you see in Crime and Punishment and what Steve uh, covers is not something that just is a New York City problem. This is a New York State problem. Okay? It's not only a New York State problem, but it besieges the entire United States. As we all know, New York State is the uh, largest police force uh, in the world, and 38 states copy the police procedures. So when you copy the procedures, you copy the problems. Um, and this is why you see the systemic problems going on through Troy, to Syracuse, to Buffalo, to New York City, to Columbia County, to Nassau, and so forth. Um, and like I said, Steve eloquently captures this in his film. He captures the uh, quota problem. And uh, unfortunately, my brothers and other mothers couldn't all be here tonight, but I'm glad to be one of them to be here with you. Uh, you know, a lot of times, um, the first question people ask is um, why we made this film, and I'll just quickly speak to that. Um, this is actually the fourth project that um, my partner and I had uh, embarked on about policing in New York City. We started out looking at this stop and frisk issue. Um, and um, 
basically in the course of um, reporting on that, um, we had met a couple of um, anonymous um, cops who were involved in the Floyd versus City of New York case, the federal hearing on stop and frisk. Around 2013, when Judge Scheinlin had um, issued a verdict that the NYPD had illegally been targeting uh, minorities in low-income communities, um, everybody put their arms up in celebration thinking that this was the victory, that policing was gonna change in New York City and perhaps beyond. Um, but it was n nothing like the, you know, the, the case. And so what we were hearing on the ground was that from cops and civilians that um, the problem was actually worse because uh, it wasn't being called stop and frisk anymore. It wasn't being called anything. It was actually being conducted without a name. And this idea of like illegal pretextual searches um, was just being transferred to other kinds of uh, law enforcement engagements. And the reason for that was because in that federal hearing, stop and frisk was put on trial, but the quota was never being, was never questioned. And at the root of uh, these uh, crazy astronomical numbers in stop and frisk um, was this idea that quota-driven policing is what promotes this, um, you know, um, incredibly high, uh, numbers-oriented policing. And so uh, those officers that we had been meeting on these early projects, earlier projects decided that they wanted to basically um, make their fight transparent. There were rumblings of um, a group, a gr the growing group of them wanting to form a class action. And, um, you know, we were really fortunate to be in position to have a pretty deep relationship already three years on uh, when we decided in 2014 um, to just embark on an observational piece that would really try and make what was unseen visible to the public. Um, all of, you know, the banality of evil is that uh, things go by, you know, in the plane of day and, um, you know, are, are things that the public um, never can even identify, but it's, you know, happening right before us. And so that was sort of like the conceit of what we tried to set out and do. I just want to say one thing, you know, when uh, Steve's film came out up in Sundance, uh, it was about, I think, what, a week later, Steve? Um, two weeks. Two weeks later, the police department uh, put out a video of the chief of police saying that quotas are not allowed no more. And then he uh, made 36,000 cops get retrained. That's just two weeks after his film comes out. Um, but here's the, here's the ironic thing about this. They changed it from ticket quotas to performance objectives. So all you did was put a different hat on the pig. Still doesn't pig. Um, and this is the problem. Um, it goes on, like I said, not only in New York City, but here in Troy. You know, how can you have a government, right, that has oversight over the President of the United States, and we don't have oversight over our police departments statewide? I mean, this is the problem. And you know, Steve's film, you know, addresses the quota problem, and it also addresses, as you see with uh, Sandy, and you see him being uh, put on a street corner um, and forced to be out there for eight hours a day. I mean, Steve filmed this guy for a couple of weeks, and uh, they had him doing nothing, you know? <clears throat> and they were doing this for his retaliation for him speaking up. There is no mechanism currently right now for a cop to report retaliation. Now, I'm showing my age, but um, if you remember the movie Serpico, he talked about this in the 70s. And he asked for oversight, and what did we get? We got the Knapp Commission, no result. We got the Mullen Commission, no result. They all find that there's a problem with the departments and a problem with the corruption, but nothing ever gets done. Except there's one difference in this film. There's a part in there where Steve shows me handing out a bill called the Department of Civil Justice, and it's a new agency. And God willing, this will bring about change. A new agency that will provide oversight over the prosecutors, the uh, police department, Department of Corrections, and also bring about change within the fire departments statewide so that cops can report retaliation without fear, I mean, report corruption without fear of retaliation, and so that this gentleman can report if his kid is being harassed and he can get help against the police, or even the bigger corruption is the corruption within the prosecutor's office. 
which I call the untouchables. And But soon they're going to be touched. And um, I just want to say thank you, and I hope you can be involved with us on this, because Steve's film addresses these issues. Uh, Tommy, I was actually interested in your thoughts on how this relates to the work you've been doing. Sure. Um, I think that... Uh, I think that uh, Detective Gomez was spot on in that um, the the issue is partially due to independence, right? So a lot of the time that uh, you see the misbehavior, be it individual or systematic, the um, and they spoke to this at the uh, end of the in the, towards the end of the film where the I think the judge was commenting that the the department had its own uh, internal uh, mechanisms to deal with complaints and to deal with uh, reprimands and all so on and so forth, and they are arguing with the. Uh, I uh, forget the officer's name who had been in charge of, um, who had been in charge. Uh, Edward Raymond. Yeah, Edward Raymond, right? Um, they were arguing towards the end of the movie, and that's because, all, at least legally, when people bring complaints against, these, against the department, the, the judges look and say, well, you have your own mechanisms, right? And so what we're starting to see is that you do need some kind of autonomous kind of uh, uh, mechanism to um, that works independently of the police uh, of the police, and I think that uh, you spoke directly to prosecutors exactly who have the discretion over in cases of individual police and behavior, but it's also uh, systematic. Uh, have the have the discretion as to how they go about prosecuting those cases, right? And that means, and this is kind of like what we've been seeing uh, up in the capital region uh, as far as the. Uh, 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 the the uh, state attorney general's uh, investigation of uh, Abelov uh, that occurred uh, uh, just under a year ago. Um, the, the, the prosecutors have the discretion over how they want to treat these cases, and a lot of times it's people that they know informally, formally. Right? It's a lot of people, a lot of times they don't have any external checks on them. And so they can claim that they prosecuted a case and fail to offer a indictment in terms of individual officers or fail to find grounds for uh, uh, pursuing a lawsuit uh, or class action lawsuit, so on and so forth. Um, and there's nobody to really check them on that, right? And so that, that, that is just another layer of oversight that has to happen. And I think that those, all those kinds of nitty gritty mechanisms in the way that institutions and the law relate get overlooked a lot of time when you don't have great movies like this to really point out and really go into detail as to how that change needs to occur. I mean, this movie shows how the police department, and not only the police department, but the prosecutors have immunity. I mean, I could turn around and lock that woman up with the red shirt for robbing up Chase Bank, and the lady that robbed Chase Bank had blue eyes, but she has brown eyes. And I'm the prosecutor knowing for two years that she's in jail with brown eyes and the lady robbed the bank with blue eyes. And now her defense attorney finds out that I knew all along she was innocent. Guess what, what's, what can happen to me? Nothing. I have immunity. How can someone have immunity for committing a crime. Somebody explain that to me. Because the president can't, because the, 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 the judges can't, but our prosecutors can, but the police department can. And that's why I'm glad to have come up here, because I actually met somebody here tonight um, who's now going to be a champion of the cause with me, and my brother, some other mothers. Um, a gentleman named Mr. Bosch uh, from the radio show. But you know, another perfect example is Edwin Raymond. You see at the end of the film, he's being charged with almost reverse racism. Currently, right now, he is fighting for his job. He, you know, they, they're still charging him. He's going through court process right now, and it's the police department checking itself, correcting itself, punishing itself, and monitoring itself. How is that possible? All we have a system of government of checks and balances? Where the heck are the checks and balances? I, I was told to instruct um, any audience members to use the mic here for questions, and it's a good time to just start lining up. Far away. I'm curious what um, the scene with the activists and the and the police and the and the the twelve were saying that they needed the public yeah. support and then we didn't really hear any more about that and I'm curious what happened there and then also like in Troy, um, Tommy and anyone um, just how the public can support cops who are trying to do this work. Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, to me, that's one of the most important scenes in the film because I think it really demonstrates this idea that, you know, um, 
this is not just sort of like a left versus right issue. In fact, um, this is about the public um, almost not even being willing and ready to accept um, champions of police reform from within the police department. I mean, really what the NYPD 12 has revolutionized this idea that um, you know, never before has there been a group of minority whistleblower cops to identify what's wrong and what can be improved in policing and, and are still yet not invited to the table. And so something that kind of like haunts me is that, you know, since making this film, um, I thought that organizations would come rushing to these guys, invite them into uh, their families and, and say, hey, how do we strategize with you to use your evidence, to use what your knowledge base and um, your awareness of others within the rank and file to create a, a groundswell movement of support to really formally start bringing down this like supposed blue wall of silence. And, and yet that has not happened. And um, I, I think that that's a really alarming notion. I th a lot of it actually tracks back to this idea that the debate um, it within you know, police reform circles largely, and for good reason, has sort of focused on abolitionism as a solution. I mean, and, and while I absolutely understand and sympathize and, and you know, that communities who feel they would never call the police if they were in trouble because they are fearful of what might happen to them and, you know, being, you know, wrongfully accused of being a perpetrator of some crime falsely um, and thus lead, you know, uh, to a, uh, this kind of idea that, well, why do we even need police in our communities? Um, the, the flip side of that is that we have finally a group of officers who, if the public supported them, we could change things in the, in the short term dramatically. Absolutely, and that's part of arriving at a solution that addresses w w sort of what underpins this um, idea of abolitions exactly. And, and, and so, you know, it's, it's really my great heartache that we're not seeing that. And these guys really did risk a, and sacrifice a tremendous amount uh, you know, and, and a lot of folks, sight unseen, you know, not even knowing anything, uh, anything about them or the film, you know, are, are calling them, you know, you know, lazy, good for nothing, bad apples, that kind of rhetoric that always gets dispensed. I mean, you know, like you said, uh, the brothers that I call my brothers from other mothers are uh, all still suffering because, you know, they're ostracized. And not only that, even myself, I mean, they sent my picture out to 36,000 cops and said, beware this guy. Now, here's the guy that I solved 98 cases proving 98 children innocent who were falsely arrested in three years. I freed them, all right? They sent my picture out. Thank you. The last guy they sent the picture out to everybody was John Gotti. Now, we might wear the same suits, <laughs> but I'm not Gotti. I'm, you know, helping for the good and helping for, for people to free them. Again, like Steve said, you know, um, this film epitomizes of what is really going on. And, you know, one of the things that blows my mind every time I'm with Steve is how intimate the videos he got. I mean, even the scene of me in the kitchen, he pops up like a terrorist, this guy. <laughs> I didn't know he was there. He went to you use the bathroom. You knew he was there. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was there. I knew, but he said he was going to use the bathroom. I got the phone call, and that scene was taken without me really knowing. You know? But again, um, you know, I hope you guys can support us and get involved and, um, and follow you know, Steve on, on Twitter and, I mean, on his Facebook website, and he'll give you that. And also me on what I'm doing. I mean, we were just riding up here today, and I, I got some great news that I'm going to share with you. Um, and this is the first time I'm saying it. Uh, I'm actually got a bill for that new agency, and I'm seeing the draft of the bill Monday at 12 o'clock. All right, and so we might have a possible solution. But again, it can't just be me and my 12 brothers and sisters fighting. I need all of you to help us. I need all of you to get on our websites, um, write your council members, write your senators, and send members, support it, and support our cause. And then when we have a hearing in February or March, God willing, um, you guys, please come. And I want you to give you a voice. I want to give the voiceless a voice. Our vote counts. Let's use it. Did you have a question? Hi. 
This may be a straying, so don't answer it if it does, but I'm curious if the union has any uh, part to play in this, in the SCOPA, yes. Wow, well, you know. I ironically, they, you know, Pat Lynch, the PBA president, there are five labor unions in the NYPD. The Police Benevolence Association um, is the largest one that represents, you know, officers um, uh, on the front lines. And, uh, around 2015 and 16, Pat Lynch, the president, was speaking very vehemently against the quota, and um, and then one day he stopped. And you know, when when you think about the job of a you know labor union president in the department to negotiate contracts, salaries, benefits, that sort of thing, you know, um, something must have happened where there was some negotiation. Um, there are also recordings of um, that. Um, you know, seem to really like strongly suggest that the PBA delegates and the PBA had negotiated with the department about um, the quota number at some point. And so, you know, that's that's something very interesting to to look into. Um, but at this point, um, ironically, the the Sergeant's Benevolence Association president. Um, he actually showed up with an entourage, his vice president and another executive at Sundance when we premiered. And after the screening, he was like, you know, I want to talk to you. And um, this is a guy who gave Jeff Sessions a Law and Order um, award. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't expecting what he had said, but um, he, he, he turns to me and he says, this film is long overdue and I'm gonna support it 1000% because I believe what it's saying is the truth and the department has been not been denying these issues for years. And they will continue to deny it, and um, what you've done and what these guys have shared is incredibly important. And uh, I, I was just like, really? And so, um, you know, to this day, he's continued to share that opinion, and, um, you know, we just hope he continues to, to actually show that kind of support. But. You know, the, the, the unions are definitely, um, uh, on some level, uh, a missing link in this, at least the PBA. And that's the most powerful one there, is the PBA. And you both know we, they've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of cops talk about corruption, bring videos, and talk about all this. And what has happened? Nothing. The only department union that I know that's actually spoke up and supported this, as Steve said, is the Sergeant's Benevolence Association. The Sergeant Association, and I was skeptical about that. I wouldn't even shake the guy's hand, all right? And now he's proved himself to the point where he's actually called the commissioner. What was it talking about in the car? What he said about the police commissioner? Uh, you know, that they're not telling the truth about the quota and, and the corruption that supports it. And, and he came out and said that. So that, that was a big step, a step forward. So I give him that respect. But the rest of them, no offense, lady, but they're like tits on a bowl. They don't produce milk. They're useless. You know what I mean? Right. Well, in terms of useless, and, um, and I don't know, I'm sure because Naomi is here, that you're aware of the Capital Area Against Mass Incarceration. Yes. So in addition to Justice for Dameek, we also had an event in Albany this week with, where we also talked about Justice for Elazar, which was a case in Albany. And you're right, there's something going on in the Capital Area that we really need the Attorney General as opposed to our various district attorneys and police chiefs. I'm glad that Judith mentioned union. That was one of my questions also. It appeared from when I was looking at the 12 that I saw, there was one gentleman who was retired. All the others were active on duty or maternity leave at some level. And it does seem that in a lot of the cases over the last five years that it was unions or sometimes a dispute between the city police chief or a county sheriff and one of the unions, and even when they recognized that the officers had done something wrong and their own police chief wanted to fire them, and in many cases did fire someone who used an inappropriate use of force, but then their union came in and said, that's not part of the contract, you have to put them back on, or you can put them on leave, but you've got to keep paying them for two, three, five years of vacation. Mm -hmm. So the idea that some of the police departments that have been looking at policies and proce procedures and trying to do some changes, working with the community, working with legislators, and then they get shot down. 
So I was actually wondering if you had or were going to do any additional work with addressing some of these multi-layers because you've got active duty, retirees, I didn't see any mention of ABLE, black, uh, black law enforcement, and as you mentioned, these other groups you were hoping to jump in that haven't. Well, it's in, again, you just touched on the whole point of what I was bringing up before. The Department of Civilian Justice will mm -hmm. provide that mechanism so there will be an independent agency which will have judges and will have independent people like yourself or that gentleman, that gentleman, to be trained investigators who have no affiliation to the police department, to the prosecutor's office, or the Department of Corrections, or the fire department, so that we can get an independent investigation. And not only that, but this is the part that Serpico wanted me to put in there, which was they would have the subpoena powers and the ability to hold trials to fire them and stop the public from paying that man's vacation for beating yes. that guy to death. Okay, and this is the problem, we don't have that. So when you say to me the legislators are doing A, B, C, and D, look, I'm a guy who puts his pants on one leg at a time. I wrote this from my heart. I sat down and wrote the procedure for that new agency and I wrote the template and I went to Frank Serpico and asked him, can you please look at it? Tell me what you want to add to it. And he did, and I was graced with that. Because you know what? These legislators wouldn't write it. No, they won't. The senators wouldn't write it. The lawyers wouldn't write it. But I did the one thing that most people don't do. And you know what it is? You know the First Amendment? Everybody knows the freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, mm -hmm. freedom of press, freedom of speech. But everybody forgets the last P. Freedom to petition the government to correct injustices, to write a bill mm -hmm. to change the law. That's what I did. Because the forefathers of this country, Sons of Liberty, weren't lawyers. We just pissed off guys and said, the hell with this. I'm going to write the Constitution, and that's what I'm doing. So, yeah, you, you're right. We do have something in place for that. And if you can follow us, we'll definitely get you there. Next. I just want to say one quick thing to that comment. Um, I mean, this idea of, like, why the, uh, there's um, such trepidation for the community to support um, reform-minded officers is... Um, and to even believe that we as a society can, can pressure our um, public institutions and our police departments to reform um, is because of this idea of impunity, right? Um, officers who break the law are rarely indicted or convicted. I mean, the, after the death of Eric Garner, everybody was like, well, of course Daniel Pentaleo is going to be indicted. It's a clear breach of protocol, chokehold and all. Of course he was not. Um, you know, we have um, a chief of department that I think has cost the city $18 million in civil rights abuse claims. Uh, Terrence Monahan is his name. Um, and he is, I think, s second or third in command here uh, in our department, NYPD. Um, many of the chiefs have um, uh, been involved in a corruption scandal that was unfolding over the last uh, couple years ago. And, you know, they were able to retain their benefits and, and pensions and all of this. So the, we, we live in a, a city and a society that uh, is, is incredibly jaded and, and because there is not, uh, there's, there's not trust in our departments, our police departments, for good reason, because they, they don't police themselves. Um, at best, nationally, um, you go anywhere in this country, and at best, the highest um, percentage of what they say, trust and faith in policing for Americans has been 57%. Hmm. I mean, think about that. That's like for the institution that can have the most dramatic impact on any civilian at any point and change the course of their lives forever, as, an, as, a, as a nation, we believe at best, you know, trust our police 57%. I mean, it should at least be like a C minus or a C plus, <laughs> you know, not a flat F. Hi, thanks. Um, are you familiar with the podcast Reply All? Okay, great. Sure. So they recently did a two-part episode on... Those were the two cops in the, in the film. Uh, I apologize if I missed that. Um, did they announce that? Okay, so... Well, no, we don't cover it in the film. Okay, but, great. Um, I'm like, oh, but, yeah, uh, memory problem. Um, okay, so in the first part of the podcast, they present quotas as being started by this odd 
benevolent genius who did this kind of great thing that helped yeah, Jack Maple. Oh yeah, that helped kind of bring New York City online and gee whiz, what what a great thing he did. But that that it kind of took a dark turn and now wow, look what look at we are look where we are now. And I was wondering, well like was that your characterization? Did you feel like Reply All did a good job or was it kind of painted for the public and less for people who understood it better? Um I, to be honest, I didn't listen to the second episode because I was really like Ooh, they are really presenting quotas awfully positively in their first episode of the two parts, and I was, mm, I'll come back around to, to that one later, but um, love to hear what your thoughts are on that, and I'll take a seat. Well, I, you know, I, I read that episode quite a bit differently. I think they were just presenting the history of, of how the evolution of quotas was such a misguided kind of trajectory, right? So, I mean, basically, Jack Maple and Bratton, when they were... Um, you know, getting their chops down in transit, um, and um, back when transit was not as in fully integrated into the NYPD, but yet, you know, was a fully functional um, policing force, um, they were um, concerned about fare beating and um, trying to control, um, you know, low-level crime uh, within this very isolated environment. They took that as, and applied that to the rest of the city fully you know, dynamic neighborhoods and communities and said, okay, well, if we just flood, if we flood the communities like we did with the, the, the you know, train stations and platforms and, and subway cars, you know, and, and really target low-level crime aggressively, we'll be, able, we'll be able to root out, um, you know, larger felony crime. Well, I mean, it was such a, it was a such, it's such a foolhardy, misdirected, um, in our inaccurate <laughs> yeah. um, philosophy and approach. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean. Yeah, they went pretty far with following and using him, utilizing him, and. Um, you know, so but you see, that is the problem. You know, they made they re they promoted this guy, like you said, and you know, as as a police officer, I got reprimanded because I wasn't out there to give this woman a ticket because her inspection sticker is. Uh, about to expire or to stop this guy because he's listening to uh, Johnny Cash with no seatbelt. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that, that wasn't my job. I, my thing was to make the community safe, community policing, and I would do about maybe 15 to 18 arrests a month. Now, if I saw somebody that, you know, committed a, you know, ate the red light or something like that, then I would, you know, give him a ticket because then you justified. So I averaged about maybe three to five, most seven tickets a month. And I would get my head handed to me every single time because they were like, you're not doing this. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's what you got meter maids for. I'm not that. But like I said, it was the money that the city was generating and they're still generating the same money and I can prove it to you unequivocally. And the reason I can prove it to you is every command turns in the same amount of numbers. Now tell me how there's no quota still. But again, in the police patrol guide, they called it, you have to get 25 summonses as a performance objective. It's in our patrol guide. They, they put it in there. And I said, guess what? Guess who else's patrol guide is in? Troy. That's right. I told you, 38 states copy the NYPD patrol guide procedures, and most of the police departments do. And if you go online, you can get a copy of the patrol guide and compare it to the Troy the police department, and guess what? You'll see it's very similar. About 85%. Okay. Um, thank you again so much for coming up and um, sharing your, your, your work with us. It's absolutely incredible. And thank you for the work that you do um, you. in releasing all those uh, kids. It's absolutely incredible. Um, my question actually goes to you. Um, it's in regards to that meeting with the NYPD 12 and the local activists in New York City when they were trying to, I guess when the NYPD 12 were trying to get the activists on board um, and trying to get to, them to support. Um, I know you said earlier that uh, you were surprised that folks weren't really flocking to the cops to you know, support them in their work. Well, no, more surprised after the film. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. after the I, film. I, I could understand in that moment, you know, that was a, a, an early kind of sussing each other out kind of moment. Um, okay. But, but sorry, continue. No, of course. Um, so it, it seemed like a really 
tense meeting and it seemed like even amongst the activists not everyone was on the same page i'm just wondering were there meetings that continued after that with the nypd 12 and the activists are they still ongoing and has there been any headway in figuring out how to move forward as a unit in like pursuing these quotas and the yeah and all these complaints yeah, you know, I, the Justice League was very instrumental. I mean, they were the one organization that did step up to support the NYPD 12. Um, so I, I know the guys are, um, are grateful for the support that they received. I, um, you know, they also were the organization that organized the Women's March in DC and nationally. And so, um, you know, I guess in a way you can chalk it up to intersectionality that um, when we when we connect the dots between critical issues, you know, that cut across civil society, it spreads us a little thin. And so there, there hasn't been a lot of um, ongoing support for these guys, um, not because of the goodwill or loss of love there, but, you know, um, I think because, um, you know, as an example, their organization has focused on pretty urgent national, uh, you know, theater issues. So. Um, yeah, it's it the the conversations and the community meetings did continue, um, but um, I think that at the heart of the problem is that again, you know, we as a society have had a very difficult time believing in the value of sustained ongoing conversation and and attention on this issue of police reform. For some reason, we just lose faith that it's possible, and I think we it the discussion fizzles out, the energy fizzles out. And next thing you know, there aren't being meetings planned, and um, you know it's just we wait for the next tragedy to occur. I do want to say one thing to this lady, and that is uh, about two months ago, I received the support, and for the 12 as well, uh, by the NAACP now. Okay, I was with the Austin chapter and the Pink Skill chapter, and they're going to support us. And I'm actually going to be speaking to uh, Reverend Barber, uh, who's of the National Coal. Uh, uh, NAACP. So uh, to answer your question, it's yes and no. Yes, now we got a big organization that's standing behind us, and it's going to stand behind me in Albany as well, which I hope you'll be there too. Okay, and uh, but we do need more. We need organizations from Troy. We need organizations from all over New York State. I need you all to spread the word. You know, you need to help us. Like Steve said, this film brings about dialogue. It shows you true corruption. There is, I mean, the fact that you have a young, articulate black sergeant, I mean, black officer with dreads, who's being told by a black sergeant, your words are too powerful, fuck that guy. That's what he said. It's on recording. And then give him a best up evaluation. Destroy his career for being articulate for being able to enunciate yourself maybe better than your boss can. <laughs> I mean, you want to, you foster that. You want to force the people who are going to be role models and examples. Instead, what they've done is ostracize my brother, Edwin Raymond. Okay? And, and you know, we're going to put an end to this, but we need your help. Next. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so I taught in uh, the Bronx for a very short period of time, and... Um, a fellow teacher took me on a bit of a driving tour of the area where a lot of our students lived and pointed out a couple of buildings that she called million dollar blocks, mm -hmm. um, which referred to the amount of money that was being made by arrests uh, on those blocks. And I, I know that there are a lot of powerful numbers that, I'm sure there are a lot of powerful numbers you could cite um, that are involved in all of this. And I'm just curious about yeah, what that money looks like in this system and, and where is it going and um, you know, because I'm assuming that that's what's driving all of these arrests. Sure, uh, you know, it, it's a very difficult um, set of revenue numbers to fully track for good reason. Um, the department is very resistant to give up those numbers during the course of our filming, um, but what um, is available by way of the comptrollers that there are, um, you know, uh, multiple agencies, but the NYPD being the major contributor um, generate, um, for example, $184 million in quality of life um, summonses and arrests. Um, uh, I think um, seven to 15 million in just asset forfeiture 
um, revenue, right? So when they, when they arrest somebody, they take the property, don't necessarily always return it. Um, $545 million in just traffic summonses alone. So the traffic agents, employees of the NYPD are set, um, you know, with this task of go, uh, nearly impossible tasks to meet unless you are working your ass off. And uh, uh, the interesting thing has been when traffic agents have come up to me, um, so far um, after uh, screenings, two have come up and totally separate from each other, saying that you, don't, uh, you have no idea how hard we're getting hit. Can you make a film about just the traffic agents' quotas? Uh, and there's not supposed to be one. That's, they do 38 summonses a day. I've seen traffic agents wait by somebody's car so that minute of the meter dies out. I mean, this is the kind of stuff. Or give it the ticket before the minute dies out. It's happened to me like 20 times. I mean, I keep asking them, I said, did I break your sister's heart? I mean, why do you guys keep ticking to me like this? And then I found out it is a quota. Actually, we were uh, trying to form a class action for that as well. Uh, we had one of the traffic agents give us a copy of the patrol guy, which laid it out on how many tickets is they write for the foot traffic agent and for the traffic agent in a vehicle. And it's uh, between 30 and 38. If you are in a vehicle, it's 30, and if you're on foot, it's approximately 38. And this is illegal, and this is what they're doing. And as I, like I said before, they're doing it in Troy. But um, again, on those, you said that the rest uh, were generating the revenues. No, the summonses are generating the revenues. They don't want you to do that many arrests. They want more summonses than arrests because the arrests don't generate the money that the summonses generate. But arrests do generate um, um, criminal court um, fines and That's fees. That's right. So they're, when you plead guilty, you're exposed to a whole menu of um, potential revenue earning fees and fines. And taking your assets and the money that you add on you. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say something. I think it's also important to put in a bigger perspective. If you look back to like the DOJ reports that came out in the early years of uh, the Black Lives Matter stuff, like from Ferguson, it's that uh, they cite these kind of revenue, the streams of revenue that are generated by the summonses and arrests. And I think it's important not to uh, um, to read into a purposeful, like a driven need to raise revenue, but uh, also understanding how over time as you know changes happen with tax revenue changes happen with local politics and so on and so forth that uh departments may become dependent on this revenue or the county or the whatever you know uh, may become dependent on this revenue in ways that they didn't see uh, uh beforehand when they kind of impose you know a quota based model of policing so That's right and so it's like a bind a, a bind uh, a trajectory that they get locked into in some, in Absolutely. some ways they rely on those line items to keep them in the black yeah, yep. yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, director, job well done. Uh, Investigator Gomez, I have a question that's geared somewhat towards you. Okay. Two questions, actually. One is, how did you survive without being injured uh, doing what you were doing in the streets of New York City? That's one question. And the other question is somewhat personal to a degree. I have a young man, he's 14 years of age. He was in a school fight. He broke a young kid's nose, they're about the same age. He has now assault in the second, assault in the third, and conspiracy in the sixth. 14 years old, school property, little fight. It didn't get carried away, no weapons or anything. So what would be your uh, professional opinion on that? Okay, well, let me answer uh, part one first. Um, they have hurt me. Uh, they have hurt me by uh, trying to, like I said, putting my picture out there, saying all the cops to stay away from me, that, you know, watch this guy. He's going to try to get information. The funny thing about it is that all the cases I solved, I never went to the police department to get my evidence. I went to the street. You know, I mean, I'm kind of like the guy from the... Uh, Humphrey Bogart movies that's in a diner all the time and eating coffee or, or I mean drinking coffee having a donut with somebody in the street or going to the subway I mean three months ago I was in the subway sandwich stop um, store with 25 crips so I can get statements gang members you know and to get on their uh, websites and so forth to solve a crime you know um, and they've hurt me in the sense that now some cops 
see me as a hero, and the other half of the department see me as a threat. And the sad thing is, is I'm not a threat. If you're corrupt, then you got to fear me. If you are uh, bad, you got to fear me. But if you're a good cop, you got nothing to worry about. I'm not against cops. I'm for police. There are a lot of good police. But like Serpico said, 20% are corrupt. I think it was 20% he said, and like 80% want to be good cops. <laughs> okay? Now, that hasn't changed. So, you know, I'm trying to change that, and so are my brothers from other mothers, and, and we're going to do that together. Now, to answer the part about uh, that kid, well, I only got one thing to say, and that is, <coughs> here's my card, because that's the kind of case I would take. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, and I would try to help that guy. All right, and it'd be my pleasure. Thank you. All right. You know, you got to remember, it's not New York City. It's New York State I work for. I work for the whole state, and I go everywhere. I mean, I got a case now I had an, uh, for a young lady who was 14 years old, and she was so beautiful, so eloquent, and she got ran over by a police car. And uh, the guy looks out the window and goes, yeah, she's alive, and then drives away. And they broke her neck and everything. Now, I don't know how and what angels of heaven were guarding this poor girl, but she broke her neck and part of her back, and she has this device where she's like this with this, you know, metal frame around her, and she has to walk like this, but she's alive. And I went out there, and they says, hey, you're that guy from New York, you know? And I says, yeah. And they says, uh, can you come out here and help us? And I went out there, and guess what? I found the video. You know, somebody was filming. There was a barbecue. And on one of the videos, I went to about 150 people, and it took me three weeks, and guess what? I found one person that was filming a girl talking to a guy, but off to the right in the video, you could see the car hit the girl, and the guy looked out the window. So, I mean, you know, on cases like that, I always say, like I say in New York, there's always a camera, there's always a video, and there's always out there. The evidence is always there. You just got to go to the street to get it. If I can help that family, I will. But there is one thing I got to tell you that I tell everybody. I only take cases of innocent people. So if they feel that, you know, this was just a minor thing and he's getting hammered by so many ways, no problem. I'm your guy. <coughs> Next. Um, <clears throat> so something that was said in the movie uh, at one point was, you know, it's about the money, right? Yeah. And, you know, I look at, or I look at this and I listen to your plans for this uh, this bill that you're that you're pushing, and I'm wondering, is it about the money? In other words, do you have the money in there? Are the cops gonna lose their salaries? Are they gonna lose their pensions? Are they gonna lose? Is it gonna hurt them, or are they just gonna keep screwing us, and we're gonna keep paying taxes? for them to get comfy retirement packages after question. they shoot people. I love your question, and I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, because uh, that's one of the things this Monday that I'm sitting down with the Assemblywoman is to uh, go over and the draft on that is that, one, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of paying the taxes for roughly about $150 million a year that get paid for police corruption lawsuits. Are you not tired mm -hmm. of that? Because it comes out of your money. Yep. I'm, I'm tired of that. Yep. That's yearly. Do you know that they allocate a budget to pay these lawsuits? <laughs> How come are we allocating a budget and not coming up with a solution? But when I ask that question, it's like you hear the crickets. You know, you, nobody, nobody answers that. And then that other part about, well, is, are they going to come attack us after we go complain? This agency, that's why I said it's going to be made up of uh, people who are not affiliated with these departments so we can get a fair and impartial uh, hearing by a real judge who's not affiliated with the prosecutor's office, who's not affiliated with the, the Department of Corrections or the NYPD. Now, people in here go, well, how do you get somebody that's not affiliated? It's very easy. You want to know how? Is there a lawyer in this room? Jesus, there's usually one. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, the thing is, is this. Any lawyer is graduated with a Juris Doctorate. And we're going to interview lawyers who show that they've been 
uh, civil defense lawyers, uh, defense lawyers with a reputation for protecting and standing up and protecting people. These are the people that we can turn around and make them a judge. So any lawyer can be made a judge. And one of the guys that um, if we do, uh, God willing, make this agency happen, and I really mean that from the bottom of my heart, is, is that I'm recommending uh, Monday that Norman Siegel, he was the former president of the ACLU, and he's 72, he's gonna get mad at me, but I told him to shut up, he can do it, okay? Um, get him to be that first judge on that panel and to you know start off this agency. So yeah, we're gonna protect you and that's what this agency will do so that if the cops do try to retaliate against you or the prosecutor, like in this gentleman is doing a radio show here, Mr. Bosch, he was retaliated against by the prosecutor's office. Forget about the cops. He was at another level, all right? Who protected him? Oh, and by the way, you guys paid his $250,000 uh, payment that they had to pay him for falsely arrested that guy, all right? I'm sick of that, aren't you? So right. help, help us. So that's, what I'm, that's what I'm wondering. Does your bill... Address that. Yeah, it address, does address that. Address the money issue of, yeah. of making the cops pay for their misdeeds instead of making us pay for their misdeeds. Well, it, it makes the cops pay... Well, if you have to understand something, cops have... Um, when you're a police officer and if you do something wrong, they have... Um, the department has lawyers that represent them. So that I can't get away from. You know, you're going to have cops get represented. What it will do is stop them from getting pay. We're not going to continue paying them for beating that man up at 7-Eleven or for falsely arresting that lady right there. No, we're going to stop that. You're going to get. You're going to be suspended without pay. You're being sent home. All right. You're not getting a vacation. I mean, that kid right there, Pedro Hernandez in the movie. That kid was arrested six times. I got that cop gambling in the street, throwing dice. Okay. And yeah, in uniform. You can look it up. Detective David Terrell and throwing dice in uniform. He's arrested 13 times falsely. That's right. Now, I only solved six of his cases because I met him at the sixth one. But what I'm saying to you is, is that here's that guy. He's suspended, and he's still getting paid. Yeah. And I have videos of mothers that he sexually assault, uh, tried to assault and who don't know each other and all describe the same thing. Now, when I got six women saying that this guy said A, B, C, and D, and they don't know each other, and they're all saying the same thing, I can't call six women a liar. But you want to know something? They're still keeping them. And this happens all the time. I mean, and, and this is why we have to put a stop to this. So I hope you're going to get involved and at least spread the word, because that's what we need. Like Steve said, this film is to bring about conversation. What Steve captured in Crime and Punishment is he showed you corruption. You saw it. You saw it. It's on there. You know? I mean, it's insane, you know, and, and, it's, and it's sad because, like I said, it's not a New York City problem. It's a New York State problem. It's all our problem. Help us. Manny, what do you think about um, having wrongfully convicted civilians be part of a review panel? Yeah. You know, in addition to judges, attorneys. Um, I, I agree with that because that would also add another layer of legitimacy. Like I said, you know, we have these departments, and such as Troy has it too. Uh, I was looking it up uh, two hours ago. Um, they have their own administrative hearings. So they're judging themselves, again, like the police department in New York, punishing themselves, correcting themselves. And then here's the beautiful thing. Let's say you're the magistrate for the Troy administrative hearing, and I'm the, the Troy police chief, and you say, that woman is innocent? I can say, screw her, she's an activist. Get off the job, you're guilty. And there's nothing you can do to me. He has that power. So does the police commissioner in New York. So does the police commissioner in the Hamptons and Columbia County and Nassau County. What is going on? How can we give people that power? You know, in the, in the sixth chapter of The Prince of Machiavelli, he said what? Absolute power absolutely corrupts. Like Machiavelli said, I'm not here except the status quo. I'm here to just upset it and destroy it. And that's what I'm here for. Okay, but so my question, I understand that the cops' legal fees are going to be covered. And I understand that you're trying to get the cops to stop being paid. Yep. Okay. But my, the other part of my question, I guess, is when 
when it's found that the cop did wrong and the city pays out a million dollars, why should I be paying that? I didn't do anything wrong. Can well, we change that? I think that's well, part of the, uh, unfortunately, the collective bargaining agreement that when cops join the union, that they are protected um, from being tried as, as individuals. I mean, it also um, is part of the problem for why the NYPD 12 were not um, on, on a certain level able to sue or make claims against the department as individuals. There was no legally sustainable pathway to th for them to make these formal allegations as individual claimants. Um, so I, I think that that's a, um, you know that's a really good point. Like cops who commit the crime should actually have to pay for the crime. Exactly. Um, and but I think that's also difficult. Um, that may track back to some difficult, more complicated structural issues about just the, their the nature of their employment. But the city is liable, and that's something I agree with you, and I wish I could change that, but they are liable because he's a representative of the city. So if I shoot that woman accidentally, but I meant to shoot him because he was robbing the bank, her family has the right. I'm sorry, I keep using the lady with the red. Right? <laughs> I use the lady with the beige. <laughs> but, you know, there is a serious problem. I mean, on average, what this uh, New York City is paying between 200 to $300 million in settlement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is a tremendous amount of money that... The public does not really, really fully acknowledge. And that's just the city. Imagine yeah. the state. We could pay off the deficit with the money we play. Go ahead. Well, we just want to thank you so much for coming to the Sanctuary for thank you. Independent Media. Thank um, you. Really appreciate it. And um, come back and, and keep us informed. Oh, well, so love thank Can you, you so me much. Favorite? Can we like all take a picture with you after this? All right, and, uh, and I'd like yeah, to also, also if, you, if any of you want to follow the status of the NYPD 12, uh, Manny Gomez's uh, Department um, of Civilian Justice, um, and just you know, be in touch with us, you can take out your phones right now and text 31996 and type the word reform, and we'll exchange emails. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy. We won't spam you or sell your info um, to the NYPD or anybody. But it's uh, 31996, and just type in the word reform, and you'll immediately get our email. And you can let us know if you have an, uh, an organization, a school teacher friend, a university professor that you think would want to show this film. Um, we're all about helping set up the community screenings, and whenever possible, any of the participants in the film or myself coming out. So. Um, you know, please stay in touch and also let us know if you want to get involved um, because when Manny brings this bill um, formally to Albany, he's, you know, we're going to all need your support. He's going to need it. That's right. Um, and it, it, not just in the tens, but, you know, many, many hundreds. So. Um, I, I need you guys to write your assembly members and the senators to, to demand that they support this. But I also want to give you my number too in case you need anything. I hope you never do because they always call me it's for murder or something. But, uh, if you need me, it's 347-867-6242. 347-867-6242, and it's Black Ops Prime Investigators. Or you can get on Steve's side, and Steve will get me. Either way, call me like I owe you child support. I will pick up the phone. Right. And I just want people to know that on a local level, we do have a movement. Um, the film is an inspiration, and it's a tool for us. But the work that has to get done is going to get done here. On a local level, Justice for Dameek is one of those organizations. Please pick up one of our brochures. Um, in Albany, there's Justice for Elazar. The whole Capital District has um, a number of organizations that are working toward more justice, uh, toward changing the, uh, the system of policing and are connected to some of the statewide um, to some of the statewide issues. The issues are, in fact, statewide issues. We're connected to grassroots organizations in other parts of the state. Um, and I appreciate the work that's being done. Um, and I, you know, I think some of the answers to what, how to support um, police officers that speak out have to do with um, the ways of, the, of police officers cooperating with and, and being part of the grassroots Could movements. Could you do me a favor, please? That those two organizations that you were talking about, and there's two uh, incidents that are going on up here? There are four incidents well, that are going on in all four of our capital district communities in Schenectady, Saratoga, Albany, and Troy right now. Okay, well, 
The problem with that is, is that they all want to work on the right thing, but they're not working together, and I want to work all of us together. Not we are working in, together. No, no, you're not working with New York City. You're not working with us, so we're not working together because I got the NAACP and other people. We need to get to unified so we all one strong fist coming at them. And so if you can, uh, see me afterwards, and maybe we can unify together, and I would love to do that with you. Sure, thank you. Thank you. And please let me give you all a business card, and uh, let's stay for a selfie. Steve loves pictures. All right. <laughs> one really quick question, Tommy. I, I know we have to wrap up, but... Um, can you speak uh, a little bit about, I know you, you were saying some really fascinating things about sort of the multi-jurisdictional uh, disconnect that oh, yeah. allows a lot of the sort of like um, the conversation to fall apart and the, yeah. the, the, yep. the, the yeah. pressure to be, hard, you know, divided. But can you just speak generally to like upstate here, what, what are the problems that you're seeing most rampant in policing? That need to be addressed. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, you all, we watched the film about New York City. Uh, what's distinct about New York City is that it's unified under the NYPD. Um, whereas, what distinguishes the capital region is that you have a bunch of different police departments, all um, functionally in the same, you know, metropolitan area, but uh, jurisdictionally and legally um, in very different, uh, uh, very different places. Um, so. You know, being able to have, uh, I, and I would say that this is part of the issue, is that what happens is, is that you have a, uh, a functionally integrated kind of policing community around here, going from like Saratoga all the way down to like Rensselaer, uh, out to, uh, out to uh, Schenectady, so on and so forth. But legally, um, a lot of times they're, uh, the district attorney from somebody across the river is asked to prosecute a case on the other side of the river, right? And yeah. and legally that might make sense, right? It might be able to give the uh, appearance of being autonomous and objective, but functionally these are people that they work with and communicate with on a regular basis. They're their neighbors, they're you know seeing them talking about cases, so on and so forth. And so I, I think that that's what's, uh, what's super important is that you have uh, Places that, you know, like New York City, you know, Rochester, where it's more or less a city for a police unit, whereas here you have a bunch of different police units all kind of overlapping, but also being held to account for each other. And so that's what, you know, is what, what happened with uh, the Demet shooting, uh, for example, was that they had a, a, the, the prosecutor uh, uh, for the, the officer who shot Demet was brought just from across the river, right? And it's like, you know, there is a vested interest, uh, not vested, but it, 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 a social interest in not really going uh, uh, to the full kind of strength of a prosecution because that's somebody that you have to see their family every day, right? That's somebody that you have to work with their department potentially later on. And so it's just super important when you're dealing with the local level to realize the, the distinctions between the jurisdictions and the departments and how they interact with each other. Because in some ways, NYPD is much simpler. Um, and even though it's a much bigger city and a much bigger department, right? Uh, uh, and, and it's important that you know we take lessons from movies like these, but also realize like the it, it changes across uh, across uh, you know uh, place places and uh, uh, precincts in in upstate New York. Thank you so much. Thank you for being out here tonight. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.